Right, I'm in the centre of Dublin. Um, right here you can see, I don't know if you can see here, but uh, that's Dublin city centre with the spire. And, um, hi Marion. And uh, I'm just going to go, okay, sorry. I'm going to go into the gallery. I'll just show you here. There's my painting outside the gallery. Saw art in Dublin. And I'm going to take you in. This is going to be the strangest exhibition of, uh, I've ever been to. But uh, anyway, here's just to give you a little idea of the gallery. Um, Here's the first painting on the wall here. This is called Sassine Pan and Blag. Uh, and it's a sort of, uh, it's sort of a, an art historical uh, fantasy. Um, sort of creation of the world and the expulsion from the garden and sort of the story yes, of right, original right. sin. Hello. Hello. In artistic. Oh, uh, as well as uh, moral terms, but the sort of the earliest artistic works the Venus Willendorf, you know, Egyptian, uh, Greek, medieval, Renaissance, and modern. Uh, and uh, yeah, and that, uh, the Campbell Soup and Merda, Merda Batista is sort of a play on um, uh, Warhol and uh, Manzoni. So, um, this piece is called Sancta Muerta, and it's a sort of a fantasy based on sort of the Gotham, uh, Batman, Dark Knight thing. I sort of thought about what sort of statue might, might be central in Gotham, and instead of the Statue of Liberty, I've got this uh, uh, Saint Death, Sancta Muerta figure. Um, Hi Fenton, thanks for that. Hi Fergus, good to see you. Um, so uh, yeah, the Joker is sort of showing um, Batman this uh, statue that is, is his um, sort of joke on um, uh, the American dream. And there are, I think if you can see here, there are the stealth bombers flying overhead. Um, Dishing out death. Uh, this was painted sort of in, in the the, um, the depths of the New York lockdown when um, obviously a lot of people were dying. And although I planned the painting long before, it seemed to be very uh, right for the time. So uh, this is my Salvatore Tuesday, which is. Um, painting of Elon Musk in the pose of the Salvatore Mundi, uh, the saviour of the world. Um, now obviously Musk here is on Mars and the reason he wants to go to Mars, is, uh, I mean, one, one of the reasons is that he thinks that uh, we're going to destroy this planet and so we need to get off it. Um, so I think there's a certain irony well, maybe he will. Maybe he'll take uh, humanity to Mars and save save humanity. Maybe this, you know, maybe in a thousand years' time, this will be the the icon of the savior or something like that. Uh, so here we have uh, everybody knows the good guys lost. Oh yeah, I'm going to come to to the shorelines, Margaret. Look forward to that. Hi, Lauren. Looks that's great. So this is Everyone Knows the Good Guys Lost. Again, it's the Joker sort of showing off his handiwork, which is in this case is, you know, sort of a sinking Titanic, sort of a disaster in the background. And there's a, a, a polar bear on a remnant of an iceberg. And um, the, uh, the superheroes aren't too happy. They, they, uh, they can't do anything about this. Um, um, this is... Um, the Barbarians at the Gates, uh, sort of a fantasy on the Euro, uh, Eurozone crisis and the, the sort of situation of uh, sort of the emergence of the siege mentality in different ways, you know, both with 
you know, the migrants and refugees, but also a sort of a siege mentality against, you know, internally against what are seen as sort of the internal barbarians, you know, the far right uh, or far left and other groups who are sort of um, betraying, uh, as, you know, some might see it, the, uh, the elite vision of a, uh, hi Karina, good to see you, um, hi Gabriel, um, to, to see, uh, you know, the elite vision of, of, you know, what Europe could be, the multicultural Europe sort of being um, destroyed by the barbarians. And, uh, this is called uh, The Wall. And um, obviously we've got as a Trump figure here and um, maybe Ivanka uh, looking down. Um, the wall is, is here and there's some figures um, you can see sort of running. They've obviously climbed over. Some of them climbed over and they're, they're, they're running across. And uh, the idea, I suppose, you know, when Trump talked about his big, beautiful wall, I sort of thought, well, how, what could a big, beautiful wall look like? And I thought, well, I'll decorate my big, beautiful wall with uh, abstract, modernist masterpieces and make it, you know, enormous, huge. Now, some people read this as... Uh, sort of social realism or something like that, that such a wall actually existed. Uh, it doesn't, but there's a sort of a fantasy. You know, I sort of think of, uh, when I think of what's on the other side of the wall in this painting, I sort of think of it as uh, nature, as everything that, um, that we don't deal with very well and try to put barriers up around. So um, that's sort of the idea. So, I'll keep going here. Um, so, this is a great space, this is a wonderful space to show uh, work in. This painting uh, is called Reaper, and the idea, um, I, I used to grow up um, building airfix models, and I used to love the sort of the aviation arch, you know, the things that were, uh, uh, the, the, the covers of the airfix boxes and, and stuff like that and I thought I w it would be interesting to do a picture that's sort of redolent of that sort of artwork but with a sort of an allegorical landscape underneath and this landscape is bisected by a wall and on one side it's sort of green fields and the shining city uh, you know sort of the perfect you know what you might call the global north and on this side um, you can see there it's all pretty um, apocalyptic and you've got this sort of squadron of, of reaper drones flying from the, the rich world to drop their load on the, the sort of the, the, the chaotic threatening uh, world on the, on the other side of the wall and I, you know it's, it's a simplification of um, uh, the world that we live in but I think there's a little bit of, um, you know, an edge mm -hmm. to this image. Um, now, this is called uh, An Ape's Limbs Compared to Man's, and it's a big picture. It's 240 centimeters wide, 8 feet, and it's a multi-figure composition. The theme is the... Um, uh, where are we going, essentially, and um, the original inspiration was an illustration in the Time Life book of primates which compared uh, a man's proportions to that of a gibbon. Um, and I took that illustration and built a, a sort of a narrative around it, and I started you know, in the background, you've you've got the sort of the walking evolutionary figures from you know coming up here, evolving um, slowly into the you know the full the modern man here who's walking. His the future is is uh, behind a drape, and 
the whole thing, uh, the whole picture is constructed like a sort of a, a last judgment doom, a weighing of souls. So it's all about weighing and measurement in uh, sort of a scientific context. The, the center here, the monkey, is being weighed. And it's about, I suppose, it's, it's about our dysfunctional relationship with nature. And, um, uh, you know, the dodo, I painted my daughter in here um, beside the dodo, and she's holding the original sort of illustrative text that was to go with the, the illustration. And um, behind her, this is one of the, the see no evil, hear no evil monkeys. This, uh, these two figures I lifted from a birthday card. There's a gorilla and his keeper, and it said, there was a speech bubble coming out saying, don't cry, and on the inside of the card it said, you're only another year older. But I thought they could be sort of lifted along with a sort of priest figure to make this into a sort of a crucifixion scene. And uh, that's what I wanted to, to do with this. Um, so, to keep going, um, I've got one of my little sort of plastic bag and fruit studies here. Uh, these are apricots. And then I've got my self-portrait here, which is what I call pushover. Um, which is sort of I, I wanted to I wanted to paint a self-portrait on the diagonal, um, and I, I sort of felt I needed hands pushing me to sort of justify the the uh, angle, uh, but it's sort of to some extent it's about you know conflict and um, being at the rough end of of uh, things, and uh, here's another. Um, painting uh, fruit in a plastic bag. These are blood oranges. Um, so, this is called Preaching to the Converted. Uh, hi, Dennis. Good to see you. Hi, Lauren. Um, this is based on a Bellini baptism of Christ, but um, you know, while I love Bellini and I love the the, um, the sort of the Renaissance religious paintings, I can't do a literal copy of them because that's not where I come from in terms of my beliefs. So the question for me was how I could uh, adapt the the language and the format of the uh, the sort of the religious painting to carry a contemporary message. And I thought mm -hmm. that message might be carried by um, uh, substituting um, a little um, amphibian for, for uh, Jesus here. And he's being baptized, which is obviously ironic um, because of, you know, amphibian shouldn't need the waters of life exactly, but he's in a dried up riverbed and the water is coming from a bottle, in this case a bottle of Ballygowan Irish spring water. Um, so I'm, and I painted my children in very much in Bellini-esque poses as, the, as the, the sort of the angels and witnesses and then there's sort of uh, also a host of frogs and other amphibians here witnessing the, uh, the baptism and up. Uh, where God the Father would be, there is a, a central banker sort of dispensing money, um, which is sort of an irony. Um, I suppose it's, uh, you know, the question of who, who the most powerful people in the world are. Some would think it's the central bankers, you know, because they can create money out of nothing. They can just add notes onto a bank account and create money. And in, in our world, that's, that's power, isn't it? So, um, so yeah, that's, that's sort of um, creation ex nihilo, isn't it? Uh, but yeah, there's the, I painted myself as sort of a John the Baptist figure, you know, sort of the voice crying in the wilderness sort of in this sort of perverse act, uh, sort of a parody of a, of a, of a baptism 
They're representing, I suppose, a sense of powerlessness before the, the tragedy of what we're doing to the planet. Um, this is my uh, painting, Four Horsemen, and it's, uh, it's Woody, of course, Woody from Toy Story. And, um, you know, uh, my friend Joe Bravo was saying the other night, we were talking about this, you know, how could I do this to poor Woody? Uh, but he's, he, he and uh, his horse are clearly deranged and it's, um, I suppose it's a comment on the, uh, hi Dermot, it's a comment on the, the derangement of the American body politic, you know, if you've been watching it recently, God help us with the, the presidential debates and stuff like that, but things are getting pretty crazy and uh, that's, you know, this is sort of an image of maybe an out of control, um, slightly deranged America sort of galloping towards the apocalypse. So, this painting is called The Best is Yet to Come, and it's based on a map of what um, the British Isles, Ireland and Britain would look like uh, with in a sort of a rather extreme global warming, rising sea levels uh, scenario. Uh, so I've sort of, I, I imagine this is, you know, maybe several hundred years from now and I've put St. Patrick and um, uh, Winston Churchill as sort of the, the respective patron saints of our lands, which are now an archipelago of islands, sort of cheering, uh, you know, saying in, in St. Patrick's case, peace, and in Winston Churchill's victory. Um, if it is a victory. But uh, again, it's sort of looking at the strange world that we live in and where we're going. Um, this is a little bit more concave. This is Black Hole. Uh, the starting point was the, the activation of the Large Hadron Collider in CERN and wanting to... There was this idea that, that it might generate... Uh, the the uh, LHC might generate a black hole which would swallow the planet, um, but you know it didn't, at least not so far. But I thought it was an interesting idea for an image, you know, which at the, the, the center point of this depression is just outside Geneva, but it's also a sort of more a, an allegory for Europe's woes, you know, the political. Uh, Hi, Lauren. Glad you like it. Uh, the, the sort of the political crisis, the sort of the failure of the federalist dream. And you've got these sort of elite European figures sort of looking on uh, at, the, at the disaster, you know, as sort of spectators. Um, this is my painting. This is an older painting from 2010, but it's one I still really like. It's called A Dying Art. And it sort of represents the two sides of my... Um, art as I see it, you know, on one side you've got uh, essentially a force and will, you know, an urge to, to sort of push forward, um, not necessarily knowing where you're going, it's sort of half blind, but, but, you know, pushing, striving, and on the other side you have this figure who is sort of backward looking and is sort of more related to ideas of memory and lyrical feeling and is also old, you know, that, there's, that it's about old things and old, uh, old wisdom and that this is what the other guy has to sort of carry forward. Um, I suppose, you know, I love hill walking and mountaineering and I love the effort of, uh, you know, climbing up that hill, you know, and you have to just slog up the hill and then you get to the summit, and especially at evening time, you know, when the sun's going down, you get this sort of amazing, clear, high-altitude light. So that's what I wanted to conjure up in that, this painting. So, now I'm going to come and take you uh, upstairs. This, this is an amazing gallery, it's a great space. So, um, I'm 
This is a little painting called Oil, and it's a little bottle of linseed oil. And um, I kind of like it. This is a painting called Flowers. And it is what it says on the tin. Um, I've been trying to get into flower painting just as something, you know, as a, a break, a, a breakaway from what I've usually been doing. And just to paint something that's just sort of powerful and pretty. And I'm going to take that this a little bit further. But these are just, they're actually uh, chrysanthemums. Some people thought they were daisies, but they're chrysanthemums and they're just cut short. But they make a nice little bunch. Now, up here, uh, we have here, I'm just going to turn this around. A little bit easier to hold now. Yes, yeah, so these are some of my little, what I call my bread and butter paintings. This is a jug of water and uh, a sliced pan in a wrapper and a more traditional loaf of bread. And here there is um, it's a honey and spelt loaf. I liked the sort of the shape that the the, um, the sort of the falling over um, slices made. It's almost like a trilobite or something. It's almost like a living form. Um, you know, the idea, you know, these are very simple paintings and people tend to like them, their simplicity. They're not as complex and mind-bending as some of my other pictures. And I sort of go between those as a yin and yang thing. You know, I, I need to paint very simple things at times. And then at other times I need to really go to town on, you know, you know, to make pictures as, as sophisticated and as multi-layered as I can. But these are conceived as, as uh, um, works of gratitude, I suppose, is how I think of it, you know. Um, there's a phrase from Heidegger where he, he talked about a kind of thinking, which is also a kind of thanking. And that is a concept that I really like. So I wanted to make these as just like little offerings um, of, you know, things, simple things to be grateful for. Um, this is one of my big landscapes. I've made occasional forays into landscape, and I'm not sure that I'll ever be a great landscape painter, but I do try the Sugarloaf in Dublin and I wanted to sort of capture a really panoramic feeling and I love, you know, the great thing about the Irish skies is how many different types of clouds you can have and how many different types of weather you can have at the one time, uh, you know, or, or, or in close succession. But this is sort of, this sort of weather is just a change, you know, there's a change in the weather coming, there's a new front coming in and uh, that's what it tells you. Um, but, you know, I do, uh, I, I love the Irish landscape, I love being out in nature, but it tends to be something I don't particularly like putting a frame around, you know, and that uh, images in, in art, um, oh dear, sorry, I'm, I hope I'm not, uh, maybe I've got my hands over the, the speaker, maybe that's better. Um, images in art, you know, the, the whole idea of a framed image, uh, I think there are some experiences that shouldn't be framed, and that's how I tend to relate to the landscape. You know, I like the openness and being in it, rather than it being a sort of a, a picture window that you look uh, towards. So that's maybe why I'm not such a great landscape painter. I prefer to work in the studio and sort of construct images, but I still love, I, I, I'll always make an attempt now and again at it. Um, this is a little bunch of, you know, a little set of Bramley apples. And again, you know, when I go to the supermarket, I'm always looking for something that, 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 that represents sort of an interesting package to paint that um, presents the objects and sort of wraps them. And then I can take that and wrap it further into an artwork, you know, and put a frame around it and make it look special. Uh, so that's what I'm trying to do there. Um, another of my bunch of grapes. 
that's sort of it's been been a standard of mine and and a, a um, you know I've, I've I've tried to make the bunch of grapes uh, the sort of subject that anyone who pinches a bunch of grapes has to come up against me. You know that I've just done it as bad as well. I hope as it can be done, uh, but I'm still trying. Um, you know I still think there's plenty of room for improvement. But it's just, you know, you can take one subject, maybe, and spend your whole life uh, painting it. Uh, this, again, is, um, you know, something else in a wrapper. Uh, three Peppers from Tesco. And, uh, again, you know, just loving the way that the plastic and the wrapping can sort of break up the form. And you know that they're peppers, but it also just, you know, when you go in there, it just breaks up into blobs and facets of color and uh, can have a, a fascination. Um, and yeah, here's another of my bunches of grapes. Again, you can see, I don't know what you can see there, but it's the paint is pretty um, heavily and freely applied and dragged and all the rest, but when it comes when you come back, it should look just really natural. That's what I try to aim for. So, change of tone. This is my um, versus cubists. Uh, this is sort of I, I've always sort of had a had a fascination. Oh, thanks, Vinton. Um, you know, the Guernica is a picture that fascinates me, and. Um, um, you know, I've, I've never entirely taken it, been able to take it as seriously as, you know, the, the, the story. I've never really found that I had great sympathy for these, that the potato head people in, in, the, in, the, the, in the painting. I know it's on a really serious subject, but I sort of thought, you know, if you want to tackle the issue of fascism and... Uh, the you know the, the the craziness of our world and the the, the reemergence of a lot of the old monsters from the 30s in our time that uh, it would be interesting to sort of take figures from Guernica and put them in uh, a, a new setting that might might even make the whole idea more terrifying you know to have these dinosaurs and have these sort of these uh, figures, you know, chasing the the um, the the cubist, you know, Picasso's figures, like right? they're in retreat. I suppose I also see this as a comment on um, on modernism and the sort of the retreat of modernism, the, the sort of the reemergence of uh, a sort of a more traditional form. Um, as uh, you know, as, as modernism is retreated, so there's a bit of a sort of an in joke in terms of my uh, my own um, you know my own aesthetic. Hi, Debbie. Um, uh, my own you know notion of where I fit in with art history and being able to play with old works and styles and being able to mock. Um, freely uh, and, and use work from other periods with sort of a certain sort of irreverence. Uh, this sort of follows some of the same themes. Um, in this case, the princesses over here are uh, uh, admiring. Um, the Picasso Femme d'Algier, which sold, uh, it was the uh, highest selling um, painting at auction until it was overtaken by Salvatore Mundi. Uh, but the Joker is showing the Disney princesses this, this work, um, while on the other side the superheroes are looking on um, angry and appalled uh, the sort of the, the the corruption and the decadence that this uh, the, the, the 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 sale price of this work rep represents, 
and um, in the background there's a deflating globe and there are helicopters flying overhead and they're dropping money and some of the money here is sort of flowing out and, and cascading over the uh, the Femme d'Alger like, like a uh, sort of a, a shower of gold which is my comment I suppose on what's driving the art prices you know it's it's helicopter money it's central bank money printing which is being sort of sucked up by the wealthy and then used to buy assets and then in the foreground you've got the bunch of grapes and the, and the fruit um, sort of as a, as a sort of a foreground you know almost for something really small as large as all of these worlds like you can fit the whole world in behind these fruit and it becomes I suppose like a vanitas painting and also a way of um, uh, you know looking at priorities you know looking at that perspective you know how what is you know I think there's more authentic value maybe in the pear and the grapes than there is in all the sort of the bullshit behind and that you have this balance between something that's sort of natural and you know tasty uh, and, and, and good for you with the sort of you know the sort of mess of tasteless junk and, and, and horrible um, politics going on behind. Uh, thanks Maura. Um, gra delighted you, you uh, like the work. I hope you can get in to see it at some point. So um, this is called Asymmetrical Warfare. Um, this is, uh, it's a self-portrait, you know, that's me. That's me up on my dinosaur. And my dinosaur is my medium, you know. My dinosaur is painting which is a very, you know, old-fashioned way of working, you know, particularly in this age of high-tech. And it's sort of, you know, this is the medium that I'm riding into battle with my assembled troops, and we're going to fight uh, the enemy, you know, whoever the enemy is. But uh, that's sort of, it's an aspect of how I see myself. It's a bit humorous, but it's, there's, a, there's a sort of a serious element to it, too. Now, this is called um, Rex, and I'll just I'll stand in front of this stage. And it's also on my forward facing camera, it always seems to be brighter, so you might actually see this picture a little bit better. But it's a big T Rex skull, about life size. I'll just move on so that you can see. And there's a human skull, about life size. Um, in front of it, wearing a party hat, a part, you know, sort of king's um, crown, and obviously Rex. Well, it, there's a little bit of a pun, you know. You've got the T-Rex and then this little king figure. Um, the inspiration for this was a, a a diagram in one of my kids' dinosaur books, which showed a human skull beside one of these big skulls, and I thought that's a great still life in the, in, in the making. So I um, I couldn't get a full size T Rex skull; uh, they're rather expensive. But I did get a quarter size T Rex skull from the British Museum, and essentially blew it up, you know, painting, I, I still painted it for life, but I sort of blew up this, this smaller model to create this. And I think there, there are three versions of this topic, and uh, they've always been really popular. You know, kids really love the image, and it's very legible, you know, the idea is very legible. But I wanted, you know, the skull is always sort of a vanitas symbol, and I thought, um, you know, uh, if you're going to have a skull in the painting, you know, let's, let's really go to town and uh, have the biggest, you know, have the big, biggest fuck off skull you can get. So, um, this painting, this is a monkey painting. And again, it's a sort of a vanitas. It's based on the sort of the notion of the, the death of painting, the idea that painting is sort of history and dead. So you've got the skull, this monkey skull on the artist's palette and uh, you know the 
the, the monkey was often the painter's symbol. You know, you had the notion of the monkey painter, uh, the, the, the Sanjali, you know, monkeys were often shown painting pictures because they imitate, you know, monkeys, you know, they ape humans, they ape whatever's going on around, you know, artists do to some extent that we are, you know, we're nature's apes. So that's what that refers to. But I threw in sort of evolutionary references to, to mock progress at the same time. So you've got Darwin, the origin of the species from ape to Adam, and then this classic standard sort of walking evolutionary figures at the back, you know, and this is usually sort of the triumph, you know, the triumph of man in, in progress. But then here I put uh, Masaccio's Adam and Eve to that, and the, the three uh, monkeys, uh, hear no evil, speak no evil, see no evil, and the apple, and they are sitting on this book of monkey painting. Now, there, there actually is monkey painting. Um, oh, sorry, the mic. Um, uh, there is a, uh, a book called Monkey Painting, which I have, which is sort of like an academic uh, um, study on monkey painting, and I substituted my own name for the authors. Um, but it's sort of a bit of a mockery on the notion of, of progress and the, the notion of, uh, you know, the death of painting. This is my version of the screen um, uh, with dinosaurs. You know, I thought uh, we're a very um, um, species-centric uh, species. You know, we always think of despair and, 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 and the rest in, in, in terms of humanity. And I thought, well, what would it be like, you know, imagine the despair of the dinosaurs facing their own extinction. Uh, so this is, you know, I've got this big sort of apatosaurus or something like that with its heavy earth being, it's being chased by the predators and then, you know, there are all these sort of meteorites coming down and it's like, how could anything be worse? So it's, there's sort of a version of the scream there and, there, you know, rats in the foreground, the, the, uh, the, the uh, mammals that would take over the planet. Um, so it's sort of, you know, calling it the scream, I was obviously uh, referencing the uh, um, Edvard Munch painting and um, doing a sort of a, you know, slightly facetious take on it, but trying to create an interesting picture out of it at the same time. And this is Burning. It's one of my figures of... Um, you know, man on fire. It started out, the idea for the painting started out as uh, I, I wanted to do paintings of, of the elements, you know, embodiments of the elements. But the one, uh, the, the, the burning figure was the only one that really took off. And um, I, I've sort of done a series of them and it sort of fascinated me. Uh, I, I liked the idea of uh, creating a figure that seemed to be um, you know, incandescent and almost like, uh, um, you know, that, it's, that, that he's going to share this, you know, that he's got this flame that he wants to set other things alight, that he wants to set other people alight, that he's carrying it forward. And that's, to some extent, what I, you know, how I think about what I do. Um, so this is... You know, it's, it's, it's sort of it's a personal image. I think you could read it in terms of, you know, global warming and evil and sort of our, our, the apocalyptic state of things as well. But to me, the, the burning figure is also a, a, a positive, you know, a sort of a talismanic figure. And I liked the idea of being able to sort of almost obliterate the face, you know, just to, to give the barest indication of what a face might be, but it's enough for, for the imagination to fill in. And I also love the idea of having, you know, a, a penis, you know, like smack bang in the middle of this picture. Um, you know, faces and penises, I think, are, are difficult to uh, 
cohabit in the same picture. You know, I think one of them will, will almost always get more attention than the other. But I like the idea of this very strong physical image. Um, it's a bit like, I, I think, of, you know, the Rodin's torsos and things like that, you know, where he, he, he did sort of the striding figures that locked the head or, the, or the, the arms off to create this sort of very powerful earthed um, figure. Uh, this one here is called Siren, and again, I suppose I'm trying to represent what I see as an aspect of my art. Um, that, uh, you know, this is what I'm trying to be in, in my painting. That, you know, that it's, uh, I've painted a, a female nude here and tried to, you know, make her sex, but it's not about sex. It's not about beauty for its own sake. She's there to seduce and to, to bring you into uh, another world. And um, that, you know, her, her, she's in ecstasy, but her head is pointing up. She's singing about um, profound things, you know, heart, heart, felt moving things and she is playing the oldest instrument that that ever existed essentially like this is a, a tortoise shell lyre and if you know anything about uh, mythology the lyre made from a tortoise shell is what um, Hermes made for Apollo it is mythologically speaking the first most primitive musical instrument and uh, it's sort of like you could have painted this with a you know a guitar or something like that and that's you know it almost work in terms of the pose and everything else but I wanted it to be sort of primitive you know because I think for me the language of painting is the oldest language it is primitive and you should tap into those you know those primitive depths as a painter so that's what I wanted to sort of uh, indicate there's a you know just the slightest indication of a figure in a boat that's obviously sort of listening and fascinated, and um, and that's what I wanted to to uh, achieve in this. So that is a complete tour of the gallery. It's a wonderful space. Uh, just to give you an idea. I know uh, I know so many people would like to be here and can't, and. Um, I hope that uh, this will give you some idea of what the exhibition is like. Thanks, Stephen. Uh, great to see you on here. Um, if any of you have any questions, if any of you would like to know anything, just uh, type in. I can see the comments coming up. And, um, uh, you know, I hope you have enjoyed the, the, the show. Like again, it's just, it's a great space, it's such a lovely space, and we're right in the centre of Dublin. Um, if anyone wants, uh, you know, if anyone wants to know anything about these pictures, if I can answer any questions, um, and also, you know, if, if there are any kids that would like to come in, or any, any uh, school groups that would like to come in and uh, be given a tour of the work, I would be very happy to accommodate you. Uh, the show will run for another three weeks. I know it's difficult really in Dublin at the moment because Dublin is um, in sort of semi-lockdown and it's hard for people outside of Dublin to come in. But if, uh, if anyone wants to know more, um, thanks Fergus, thanks Lorena. Uh, great, to, great to get you on here. Um, and if I can do anything at all to, you know, make this exhibition work, thanks, Laura, um, because it just has to be online at this point. But it's, you know, at least you'll get some idea of a physical space. So, um, any questions? Um, or are you all happy? Um, Thanks to everyone who who, uh, who has looked at this, and for people who won't look at it, who aren't looking at it live, but are looking at this later on. 
um, you know, thanks for looking in. I hope you enjoy it. And um, I hope some of you will actually be able to get in. Oh, don't you don't be worry. I, I joined all Elon Musk's groups on Facebook, and I dropped the uh, Stephen. I dropped uh, the the image in. So I'm hoping. Uh, you know, you never know. I'm I may be over in Texas uh, next year, Stephen. Um, I've been asked to do a demo uh, video for um, Streamline Art and uh, Streamline Art videos. So uh, I may be over in Texas, uh, Stephen, uh, maybe next year, whenever things calm down and stuff. And uh, I may call in to uh, see you, but I might actually call in to see if I can call in to Elon Musk as well. Um, that might be fun. And if anyone wants me to do stuff in, in, in Texas in terms of classes or demos or anything like that uh, while I'm over there, it'd be great. Lauren, uh, Great, great to see you on here, you too, Fenton. Um, anyway, if anyone wants to come back with, yeah, I'll, I'll get back to you, Stephen. If anyone wants to come back uh, to me and ask any questions or put them in the comments uh, or post them on my page or whatever, uh, I'd be very happy to answer. The, the one with, with uh, the Guernica figures and the dinosaurs, uh, Laura, is called, um, Dinosaurs versus Cubists. <laughs> you too, Fergus. You're a national treasure too. So, uh, okay. Well, thanks a million. And uh, I hope to uh, talk to you all again on Facebook. And... Uh, Hope you enjoyed. See you. Bye. Oh, by the way, I put an, an album up on um, Facebook which has Joseph Bravo's amazing write-ups on a lot of these paintings where he gives uh, you know, a lot more detail than I could give in this talk uh, about the individual images. And he wrote a great introductory essay too. So um, uh, please go and uh, have a look at that and read if you want to find out more. Okay. See you, Lorena. Bye, bye, Laura. See you all.